Well, hello, creatives, community, and kind folks, and of course, co-hosts. Welcome to RPG with DBJ. I am your host, DBJ, and today we are going to talk about NPCs, and we're going to talk about NPCs in a different manner, and I have to give you the preamble in terms of how we got to this point. So, um, of course, all of you know about Sly Flourish. And, um, hey, good morning there. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Uh, of course, all, all you guys know about Sly Flourish. And I was listening to, on the weekend, Sly Fur- Flourish has a uh, like a one-hour live stream. And he talks about different products. And he goes about... Uh, doing a live prep session and things of that nature. But he did come up with this. This is kind of a um, like three people removed or three positions removed uh, kind of subject matter in the sense that he was either reading or listening to someone who talked about non focal random events or random encounters. And, the term non-focal has to deal with our NPCs. And so the idea of something being non-focal is that in role-playing games, a lot of times we, we, we've we used this and thrown around this word called immersion or verisimilitude. In, in essence, it's how, not how realistic is our world, but how much um, realism within the context of the world, how how alive is our setting going to be? And one of the things that that is often compared to are like old style video games in, sen- in the sense of when the player turns the corner, there might be a monster. And no matter how many times the player turns that corner, the monster is just waiting there. And it never gives along this impression that the monster has any other purpose other than to be there once the player character, the, the, the character in the video game turns the corner, right? The monster doesn't have any particular motivations. It doesn't, it's it's literally set there to surprise the character or to engage in the character as they turn the corner. And one of the things that really brings along verisimilitude is if the player characters, if the if our protagonists are not in the story, that the story still continues, and so oftentimes, it, even till today, um, the idea of random encounters has kind of faded away a little bit, and has kind of gotten like a negative connotation to it, where players are wandering around, dungeon master or game master rolls some dice, some random monster shows up, and everyone thinks it's like a time sink or resource drain. <laughs> like Mike says, plausible living worlds are my jam. Yes. So a non, this is coming from, from listening to Sly Flourish. And it made me think about something kind of old school, but might be appropriate for today. And a non-focal random event would be something that happens that is outside the player character's purview. It is non-focused on them, such as, rolling a ran- random dice or having a random event happen over the player characters, whether they in encounter, you know, bandits on the road or a snowstorm or a landslide or a traveling caravan or something. Usually that's focused. That's a focal point for the player characters. They're going along their journey and something random happens near them. But what happens to the world outside of them? And it made me think about Sly Flourish brought up this idea that, well, maybe there's random encounters that happen uh, outside the player character's vision. So their hometown gets attacked by gnolls, or there are uh, numerous bandits on the road that was once a safe haven. And so this is happening outside the player character's view. But I think even these random events could even happen that are not what why we have considered encounter to represent combat for example npcs can get married and have children they could have uh, ups and downs in their financial success or uh, like such as an investment or a small business maybe 
maybe those weather events happen in the player character's hometowns or base of operations, and there's nothing the player characters could do about it, whether they were there or not. They can't stop the snowstorm or the sandstorm or the, the rock slides or the the forest fire. Um, maybe they can't stop the, the famine or the drought, whether it's uh, an environmental effect or something. Maybe there is a a shift politically and the rules the, the rules of life and engagement in the in society start changing and there's a new regime and the 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 rules that happen in their old town where you can walk around with your weaponry out in the open and people are like hey how are you doing now you must have papers or some kind of identification or you're unable to walk around after the sun goes down or something like that and so this topic made me think sorry about this long circle here but this made me think of the old school dungeons and dragons classifications of some of our npcs so today we think of anything other than our protagonists our player characters are considered npcs but in the old days they actually had classifications so let's go over some of the classifications uh, and why they exist and kind of like how we can use them and then kind of think of like random things that might happen to them and in their lives that then ultimately affect the player characters, which is brings this big circle of how do you get the player characters to invest in your world? Well, they're invested in your world because they're invested in all of the background of all of their own characters and all their player characters and their families and such. So you've i know some some of you youngins have heard the terms of hirelings henchmen followers and retainers and now in our modern context we also have companions we have familiars of course there are sidekicks but let's 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 go back a little bit and let's start with hirelings and henchmen now the biggest difference between hirelings and henchmen and this was back in the in the olden days of uh of ad and d where player characters roughly between levels eight to eleven were expected to semi-retire so you were expected to build a temple or a wizard's tower a fortress or start like a, a guild of some sort and you would populate them with people but also back in the day player characters didn't have or were not expected to have all the skills necessary to uh, navigate this dangerous world. So you would hire henchmen and, and hirelings. The difference between henchmen and hirelings were henchmen pretty much had combat abilities. Hirelings didn't. Hirelings were individuals you would hire on an extremely temporary basis, sometimes once, uh, maybe once meaning you would encounter them once and leave within a couple of hours or so, or you would hire them and they would specifically be hired for a temporary basis. These individuals were uh, usually skilled or experts in one field, uh, a sage going to a sage to uh, delve into the, the arcane depths was one of those uh, hirelings, but you could get hire an engineer to build a fortress. You could hire um, carpenters and um, people who made ink and what are we what are we called a uh, Wainwrights and uh, uh, individuals that were skilled in one maybe two things. Uh, sometimes hirelings would just be laborers to perform different functions. Maybe you you needed a you, your player characters needed to get the gold out of the dungeon. You get some hirelings and they help carry all your crap out of the dungeons on a large caravan and, and get back to your um, get back home. Now, henchmen, henchmen were armed individuals. And henchmen, of course, they were temporary as well. Maybe they were bodyguards. Uh, of course, you would have your, before you go in the dungeon, you have all your crap. You need, to, need it defended. So you hire, you, you'd hire some henchmen and those henchmen or maybe yeomen or whatnot, um, pikemen or something, they would surround your stuff and and keep watch over it. And also if you were traveling long distances or you you had a bunch of your, your crap that you took to another town and you didn't want to leave your stuff anywhere, you would hire these, these henchmen would come along with you. And of course they would go on some of your adventures as well. And they were 
for lack of a better term, they were mercenary. They were hired to, you would hire them for, you know, one month's journey and they would come along and they'd be a sellsword and they would, uh, they would work with you. And then they had uh, ways to interact with your henchmen and hirelings based on how you treated them, how much you paid them, uh, maybe some of your, your ill-gotten gains you would share with them and whatnot. Now, Mike says, uh, my rule at the table is to make the players care about something or someone, then endanger that love. Oh, hells yeah. <laughs> that includes hirelings, retainers, familiars, businesses, and their favorite vendor. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you could even, like, there were hirelings you could hire that would never travel with you, but you would go into town and say, hey, I need your services for something. Um, healers were a big deal back before more than 50% of player character options had healing. He healing and resurrection was a thing. I, I didn't like the idea of going to the resurrection store, but you could go to a healer and or someone who could remove a curse and you would hire the hireling. And that hireling would help you navigate the world, healing your characters, um, getting rid of those long-term effects that kind of don't really exist any longer in 5th edition, but that's who they were. And eventually some of them would, depending on your relationships with them, would move up the ladder from hireling and henchmen. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of those henchmen became player characters based on the the, the lethality of the game and how fragile a lot of those early characters were. Uh, Dead Man says Star Trek Voyager episode called Lower Decks was about the lower ranked crew members and their exploits. Uh, as a matter of fact, isn't there an animated show called Lower Decks, if I'm not mistaken? Um, but yeah, and the great thing about the, the henchman hireling idea was that, as I said, they could move up the ranks. You always had this random um, concoction of strange personalities of uh, both the player characters and the dungeon master could play with. It was almost a, it was a, at the time you could consider it to be the, the um, an organized version of creating NPCs that we could mix match, manipulate and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, one, one hireling would snore too much and another one was a really great cook and yet another one has had a lost love and whatnot. And you could really have some fun with them. And then we'll, uh, I'll get to um, our co-host Mike here and then we'll get into, we'll, we'll get into retainers and, fam and followers. Uh, Mike says making PCs caring about any PC is as easy as giving one of them an endearing quirk. Oh, hell yeah. Sometimes the endearing quirk is an accident on our part as the dungeon master or game master. That's why sometimes you might want to like shotgun a bunch of NPCs at the player characters just until one, one or more of them just sticks because you never know. Right. But anyway, um, Mike goes on to say a hireling who's always heroic might be forgotten, but the shy <laughs> acolyte with a stutter who is the uh, archivist will definitely become. The, the target of a bard who's determined to get them out of their shell. Oh, hell yes. Hell yes. And you know what? There's nothing better. Listen, role-playing games are, are an escape. And frankly, you know, sometimes we need, we, we want to have somebody cheer for us and pat us on the back and tell us we're awesome. There's nothing better than having an NPC who's like awkward and strange, but like, looks up to the player character in in one or more ways um the the player character playing the warlock or the the cleric or the paladin and the npc goes to them for advice or what what have you or the rogue who um finds i don't know orphan kids and the orphan kids are like little sneaky pickpockets but they're not that good and they look to the player character like wow he just disappeared into the shadows or the alchemist the, the hireling alchemist that looks at the same player character who's got a, a number of poisons and other concoction is like amazed that they got some basilisk poison or something and is like, hey, if you ever find any more of this, I'll gl gladly trade you or whatever. And, you know, e even the even the, the the political person who changes their mind and falls in line with the player character, right? And so while... The henchmen and hirelings can't solve all the player characters' problems. 
they can smooth the gears of the world by maybe um, move going ahead of the player characters and finding a place for them to stay for the evening or getting certain information or having them ap- appeal to the the local nobility so that they can have uh, they can speak to no- the nobility one on one um in in many ways uh, the henchmen and hirelings became the face or could become the face of the player characters if they, you know, they didn't have the high charisma scores and whatnot, that kind of thing. <laughs> Pelora's like, oh, yes. Oh, great and mighty grand champion. Is there something you need? Can I carry your weapon? Shine your boots? Back rub, perhaps? <laughs> Adoring fan from Oblivion. Yeah. <laughs> Foot rub? <laughs> Please? No, but... But but really though, I mean, if you're a bard and you're like a classic, like I do music and poetry bard, why not have a fan club, right? Okay, so moving on from the henchmen and hirelings, and again, the henchmen hirelings thing was specifically temporary. Uh, they were maybe the 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 henchmen, uh, a, a bunch of cell swords or something, are like, look, I don't want to be a farmer anymore, and we'll be zero level human beings with a couple of. Uh, uh, staves, staves, and and rusty swords, and we'll go along with you till we get to the next town, and and that's it. And who who's to say that? Sure, they could be forgotten. Player characters never see them again. No big deal. But they may also be people that the player characters can return to. Mike says. Uh, town markets, festivals, and other public events are a great starting point for a random colorful NPC. A player, a player may say they want <laughs> the shop with the best price, but they'll always shop, um, show up for the shopkeep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the shopkeep with a funny hat and a wild accent. The more flamboyant, the better. Oh, hell's yes. Yeah, player characters think they're like, I'm going to haggle till I get the half price, but really, they want the person that's like the gossip. The one with the lisp, the one with the, the the strange rat that lives in their hat all the time, or something. You know what I mean? It 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 always works that way, and it's fun. That that can be very fun. Sorry, Dead Man says the says the adoring fan was in most Elder Scrolls games. He all he usually showed up after reaching a higher level. Yeah, gotta have the adoring fan, and you know, adoring fans can be a little bit annoying as well. Like, hey, I'm the sneaky rogue, but you know. Have the have the adoring fans show up and start like, hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> he who hides in shadows has arrived. <laughs> be it known that he who hides in shadows cannot be detected at all. Look to your left. Look into that shadow. Do you see them? <laughs> right. Zamara says they have saved two children from dying in the wilderness. They have bought slaves to free them and found that you can't just give people freedom and and call it and call it that okay did i z did i skip your comments there z Mm -mm -mm. moved on me anyway and zamora says and that's beside the besides the pet hyenas that one pc has in their town with an eight year old knight in trading the the vizier the church in another town etc i i swear something must have popped away but you know what there one of the things i have to say that that um zamara kind of kind of brings up is the fact that like life happens to the npcs outside of the player's view and those random henchmen and hirelings whether it's the adoring fan maybe there's maybe the npcs are a little bit annoyed with the player characters or they're looking forward to the a particular type of interaction the the thieves guild that loves to have that you know npc the the player character come in who hides in the shadows and gets to tell them of their exploits the 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 wizard who's able to go into the 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 small wizard's tower who you know the highest level wizard there is second level but they hey you're eighth level and they're just like oh my goodness you're you're our version of a uh, of uh, you know the sorcerer supreme please tell us of the spells that you found and whatnot right and they, there could be jealousies and um, you know, imagine that and that eighth level wizard leaves town, and then weeks later they find out that the the wizard's tower burned down. Like, well, what happened? Maybe they were, were they playing with magic, and maybe they come back and investigate it, and that kind of thing. 
So, and Cameron, Cameron makes a, a good point here that I'm going to read. Um, Mike says, I've mentioned this before, but I've given PCs child fans who follow the PCs around town. Oh, hell yeah. I've done that before. Oh, yeah. One dwarf Tempest cleric had a halfling boy with a pot on his head, a gra grass beard, and a stick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cameron mentions the exact thing. Like, how can I encourage the use of hirelings? They Hirelings have really faded to the background. In, in present day, hirelings used to be used for everything. Hey, we need to know about magic. Let's go to the sage. We need laborers to carry and move and dig things out. But, you know, the hirelings were like valets and servants and things. And it can be pretty difficult to get your players to do it because today role playing games have allowed players to pretty much do everything. So what I would encourage is uh, to tie as many hirelings and henchmen to the player character's background. If they're a noble, like the noble background comes with a an individual, a servant of sorts, a um, um, a servitor, uh, not necessarily a, a servant in the negative connotation, but. Um, if if uh, like if a player character is a barbarian, have some of their barbarian tribes people, if if that's the kind of barbarians they are, um, follow them into town, and they become like give. In other words, this is a strange thing to say. Don't give your players the option. Have these these individuals in the players' lives, whether they choose to or not, and don't make it like like you better or else. Although it, just, it could be family that's or like um, like a thieves guild that specifically sends other criminals along with the thief or the, the rogue. Right. It could be that. But it might be much more fr friendly. Family members um, are account for this, whether they are um, a, a cleric. A part of a religion might be followed by other acolytes for for religious purposes or pilgrimages and whatnot. And and you know honestly, when player characters are like modern day influencers, so they might not have a choice in the fact that that they're having an entourage around them. You know the 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 noble knight that has the squire hiding behind the tree and followed them out into the wilderness. You know it, it might be a thing. <laughs> yeah 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 and like 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 uh z is saying yeah i would recommend just having them available in their face have other groups walk around with hirelings yeah absolutely yeah and have them start with allies that follow them that ask for hirelings also henchmen and hirelings can solve problems before they ever happen like forward scouts you know, oh, this it's a dangerous pathway to go along th this direction. We'll have the halfling and the hirelings warn the player characters of upcoming doom and dangers and, uh, hey, we've already purchased you five nights at the inn. And, we, and hey, I'll be the stable hand. I'll take your mounts over to the uh, local stables in the city state and I'll watch over and make sure they're fed and everything like that. And the players might look around like, oh, what? oh you'll do that for us? Sure, if you you know you have some extra coin, and then of course you add in, like Mike was saying, with some uh, funny quirks <laughs> about them. Maybe they're, they're really cool and, and cute. Like maybe there's um the young girl that plays the flute, and it just it just so happens that it's like calming or whatnot. You know all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yep, yeah, and like Dead Man says, uh, we do have a Discord. Zamara gave his full post in the Discord. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and like Z's, like yeah, like like DBJ said, thinking my ideas. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> we're always on the same page. All right. Uh, before I get back, in, oh sorry, uh, two more comments here. Then I'm going to get back into followers and retainers, which there is a there is a difference between followers and retainers who've moved up a level from henchmen and hirelings. So Mike uh, says, well, hirelings are NPCs who do one thing. That is true. All you need is a, is a job the PCs can't do or don't want to do. Exactly. Sages will have archivists and bookkeepers. Taverns might have brewmasters, cooks, and messengers. Absolutely. And um, it, when, when we think of Let's go with our classic wizard or um, spellcasting classes that have to study magic. There's nothing to say that 
within this context of the story, the sage and the archivists and the alchemists and the herbalists are doing the the legwork for the player character who is the wizard themselves, right? And it doesn't have to be specifically wizard, whether it's a, a druid circle and the, the druid goes back out into the tundra because they're the they're an arctic wizard i mean arctic druid or something and they meet their their uh their clan out there you know on a ice float or something and they said we'll we'll beseech the the um, you know the frozen gods in the north when the northern uh, stars shine or something like that and then and you could have this little story element where the hireling who only really is good at one thing maybe the history of intellect of ours or something and comes back to the pc i.e. using them as a conduit to give the player character a lot of information. And then, of course, that conduit of information has a personality. Maybe the sage has a, a cough they can never get rid of, or they only have one eye, or th they, um, they, they fold their legs in a lotus position and float above their cushions, and that's all they do. <laughs> and and um, they're blind, and they, they spout out... Uh, cryptic messages or something for the one player character or whatnot. And then they just leave. And again, more, more mundane things like brewmasters and cooks and messengers and people back in the day, today we can go to a big box store and find everything we need. Back in the day, you needed specified skills for specified things. Like there were people who only designed wheels and people who only created barrels and people who only created inks and dyes and individuals that only created burlap sacks, right? Like each, when you wanted a sword, you had to find someone who could smelt the metal and then somebody else who could forge the sword and someone else who could make the hilt and someone else who made the scabbard, right? Now, mind you, they might all be linked together, but you, if you wanted to go to an armory it wasn't very common for just one individual to do it all. There was like, there were people who just made chain mail. <laughs> that was their job. They fixed chain mail and they just made links. And now there might be somebody else forging the metal for the links, but somebody else took the links and just bang, 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 put link, link, link. And that was it. Yeah. Mike says, uh, uh, hirelings and retainers might know of hidden routes or po possess contacts in an underground organization. And again, they had backgrounds too. Just because your your very honest squire doesn't mean they didn't have their parents or their 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 uh, cousin wasn't a criminal who or they they had a gambling addiction or something like you know all that kind of stuff. Ag Agr says psychics are great. They sim simplify things for players by having skills such as like camping, hunting, contacts, weapon fixing, uh, etc. That players may not think to invest in. Um, exactly, and it, this is also a great way to incorporate resource losses that these individuals now prevent the loss of in the first place. So for example, in fifth edition, it's not really a thing for like weapon degradation, um, camping supplies to be lost. It, it, hunting, camping, getting lost and all those things kind of fade away in the background. But what you could do is say, Oh, no, no, no. In, in this game, you could very well easily get lost or eat the wrong things or camp out in the wrong place or or suffer level of exhaustion for, for traveling dangerous pathways. But if you have the proper henchmen and hirelings, they then negate that fact, which means you you players can prevent that vector of loss by ensuring that their henchmen and hirelings are treated well and whatnot. Yeah. Mike says, how many movies, how many movies show a small child who knows how to transverse a city? Yeah, outside the view of city guards. Um, aliens, anyone? Right. And 17 days, we're not going to survive 17 hours. <laughs> Remember that? And who leads the protagonist to a needed NPC? Having to chase that child through a city is one entire, <laughs> entire chase scene session. Yeah. Yeah, there's always the, the, the kid who knows the thing, that knows about the thing, that everybody's like uh, ignores, but the kid, you know, the sniffly little kid, <laughs> nose kid is like, follow me. And then the players have to like crawl on their hands and knees while the kid just ducks through some place that, who, you know, yeah, oh yeah, hell yeah. Um, 
All right. So what are followers and retainers? So followers and retainers are the higher level of henchmen and hirelings. So followers are like more permanent hirelings and retainers are more permanent henchmen. So retainers are more like they fight. They're battle oriented and they are for the most part loyal to the player characters. Now, if you go back into AD and D there were these percentages that would fluctuate based on how well they were treated and retainers aren't so much about getting paid as being supported. And this is where you can take uh, where the hireling who gets the cell sword, who is just supposed to go along with the party for the next seven days on the caravan moves up. So it's not just the, the money and the cash, the coin that they get, but how they are treated, uh, whether they, the player characters give them ranks, uh, whether they share magic items, whether they share their, magical influences are you going to heal me along you, you know you're going to heal my broken ankle along with your other uh, members of your group um sometimes they might have they need support in other areas like they want to move up the, from zero level human being to f first level city guard status right they want uh, um status maybe they need support in their own personal lives like hey i left home to go on these great adventures and I sure would love you to visit my family and let them know how successful I am. And you might have to sit down there, sit, sit with their, their uh, mom and dad and a, a bunch of random cousins or whatnot and tell them of their exploits as you, you know, drink really bad coffee or something in their front room. You know, it, it might, so retainers and you actually gained followers and retainers earned them based on, getting to your name level that was between like eighth and 11th. Usually it's, it was like ninth, but certain character classes, it, it fluctuated. I don't remember each of them individually, but um, retainers were more battle oriented. They, you could have uh, guardsmen and pikemen and lancers or archers and whatnot um, that would uh, protect you. And of course you could re depending on your character class, they would be reskinned. So if you were a cleric, they would have more of a religious bent. Um, if you were, you, you know, a ranger, you might get, you might even get things like, uh, there were random tables and you could even have things like giant blood hawks or unicorns or fey creatures and whatnot. And then followers were far more skilled in support of you. So they might be the, the, the sage who is loyal and in the employ of the player character. And of course, once you start tying more of their backstories into it, like a sage might just be a player character's mentor as well, or their their great aunt or something like that, you know, who's like, hey, you know, Sonny, I'll let me teach you some more things about the 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 dangers of magic. And the players are like, what the heck is a Remoraz again? <laughs> I'll show you. Let me go to my find my one of my books. Mike Mike Gould says, I remember AD and D and, and second edition where getting to name level meant you attracted followers. Yep. Depending on your class and alignment, you could attract a wide array of followers. As a matter of fact, uh, Matt Colville's books brought that back where you could attract followers. And some of those followers were pretty exotic. Like I said, it, unicorns and um, goblinoids and all kinds of strange, strange ones. I, um, w a player in a game of mine was an elf and he attracted bugbears and we were like what in the world and then come to find so we 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 um we flipped the script on it and the bugbears were hunting him down to kill him and he dispatched them basically without murdering them and they became like we'll do anything you say <laughs> kind of stuff and they were still wild and he was like oh no they're like chaotic evil aren't they and i was like maybe <laughs> and it kept causing trouble and he was just like stop doing it was, was it Strongholds and Followers is the book? Yeah, from Matt Colville. Uh, Strongholds and Followers. I, I have the first book, and there's a second one. War, something in war. I can't remember. Uh, oh, sorry. Anyway, Zamar says, I also have a way that I handle convincing players to hire hirelings. I limit what can be bought in an area down to a handful of themed items per settlement based on a settlement size. Um, exactly. It, it, I mean... Uh, Zamora continues, sorry. 
says part of what they can buy that is persistent from town to town are people that offer specific skills or sell themselves or giving gold for access to specific areas or who are looking for hirelings. Yeah. Now, it, like one thing can be, like, for example, the idea of, hey, when I get in town, I'm going to go to the blacksmith or the armory. Like every town doesn't have one or some places might not have them open to the public. You can't just go buy a sword wherever you want to. You might need to know someone that knows someone. Yeah, there it is. It's it's strongholds and followers. And then the other one is a kingdoms and warfare. Yeah, guys, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So hirelings and henchmen might be the opening to get to purchase a certain thing. Like it might not be that it's not available. It's just that we're not going to sell it to you. You, you know, you strange adventurer walking around with a lot of uh, armor and things like that. And also there might be individuals who help you navigate through an alien culture. Uh, and I don't necessarily, I don't mean extra planetary. I'm saying like, I, okay, today, if I went to India, I don't know the first thing about India, except um, uh, uh, curated information through mass media, right? I would not know what to do or how to navigate this place, but a guide would help me out. And that guide might tell me about uh, certain types of, of things. Do, do you bow? Do you shake hands? Um, how, how, food and clothing and those kind of things, right? Mike says, uh, you could attract a tailor or you could attract a horde of goblins or a giant. That is so true. Some of the tables were a little bit wild. It was like, because they were per percentile tables. And the, the cool thing about um, percentile, these are called percentile. Um, percentile tables was that um, you, because of the percentages, the the extreme ends of your tables, the 99s and double lots and the 02 and 01s that you roll really had, I mean, I if I'm not mistaken, I think you could roll dragons and demons and fiends on those tables um, as, as like henchmen and I mean, as retainers and followers, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. Um, Zamara says, heck, <laughs> uh, uh, I even uh, gave a guest player a chance to become a fixture in my player's town, giving them a, a, a smithing dwarf in a, a, a town that has little access to metal and little reason to attract one. Yeah. I mean, you know, who's to say that maybe one of your one or more of your henchmen or hirelings doesn't want to stay put and they go, you know what? This place needs they really need a carpenter. Um, they really need a Wayne's right or they really need a a, a, a bower or so. I don't know. There's all kinds of things like that. They they hey, they need a cook <laughs> or um, a, a, a slaughterhouse or something. And I'm going to build one right here. <laughs> Kylie's like, we don't say strange, we say Gygaxian. Yeah, there were some there were some Gygaxian things in, in the game that were just like, what? Now, so, some of the other fun things to happen with uh now that retainers and followers have kind of moved on into familiars, companions, and sidekicks, is of course the, the ability to default to using them instead of your main player character, kind of like trope style, where like like a uh, troop style where you have a few main characters and then twice as many or more sub characters that you could use within the game. Like for example, you could say like, if you wanted to do something like this, you could say, all right, guys, you have nine levels of player characters to, to create. And you could create one character that's ninth level, or you could create nine characters that are first level. You can make any combination, go for it. And then out of that mix, you can mix and match who you'd like to play. Like, oh, I've got a fifth level character and two second level characters. And the two second levels are one is their younger brother. And the other one is um, a young girl who was saved from a village that was burned down. And they're all traveling together. Like, oh, okay, sure. If you want to play them out. And, and that now, mind you, he, here we go with encounter balance. There wouldn't really be any. You would just have to navigate the world in this, you know, second level characters would have to fight or 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 run away from CR eight, nine, and ten monsters and whatnot. And maybe the, the ability to run might be a skill that players need to learn nowadays. Uh, Mike says sometimes the key 
is how to tie certain hirelings or businesses into a greater organization. That's where side plots are born. You know, is the brothel independent tied to a thieves guild or a cult of grats? <laughs> grats, right? Exactly. And your henchmen and hirelings have personalities as well. So, and, and backgrounds and even goals. Maybe they're following you because one day they want you to defeat a great evil. Like maybe their grandfather, one of your henchmen or hirelings, had a grandfather who is now a restless ghost. And if you could only excise them so that their ghost could pass on. Or, you know, one of the henchmen or hirelings, of course, like you said about the brothel, right? Maybe they, they owe a debt to a criminal organization. Well, the criminal organization might come looking for the PCs. And the player character is like, I don't know what you're talking about. And the, the criminals are like, well, your, you know, your lackey owes me, you know, 100 gold. And the PC is like, 100 gold? I could pay you that easily. And then the criminal's like, oh, if you've got 100 gold, you owe me 500 gold now, right? And and uh, now this story starts to, to, to um unwind where the player characters might be both ch both honored and blamed for the actions of their retainers, their followers. You know, the, the, the fan club may help the player characters out a lot and pat them on the back and, you know, uh, kiss their feet and whatnot. But the, maybe the people in town are like, could you get them to shut up? Cause they're chanting outside you, you, the, the in window all the time and parked outside. You got to stop that. Um, Mike says, for instance, uh, the town of Willowdale in our Carginia has an inn set up at the cro at, at their crossroads. This inn, run by Mom's Olaf, ooh, Mom's Olaf, okay, um, Olfa, sorry, pop, sorry about that. Mom's Olfa is called the Black Eagle. Despite the town housing Imperial Barracks, that inn ooh, 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 is the headquarters. Uh oh of the Black Road, a smuggling guild. The heroes both hired moms and used her services right under the nose of the Empire. Hey, how many times, how many, what we would consider innocents have been the, the most influential people in real life, like uh, Underground Railroad here in the States, right? And those henchmen and hirelings, which the player characters might find funny because they have strange quirks and whatnot, might be connected in more ways than just knowledge. It might be connected by blood or obligation or loyalty or fear um, or trauma to a greater a greater evil or something for the player characters to know about. I mean, who you know, player characters need to go into dungeon. How do they find about dungeon? Well, maybe their henchmen or hirelings or followers points them to dungeon, right? Like I, you, you, and and of course this can always be a, be a. Um, I didn't mean to upset you or keep this from you, but I have an old map that leads me to another place and blah blah blah. I mean, there, there's even been a story where we're, what was it? Kids had a map tattooed on their back, and each of the kids had a section of the map or <laughs> some some strangeness. And of course we can always play with with the fantasy elements of it, whether one of the henchmen or hireling is fey touched or uh, one of them peered into the depths of the nine hells and never recovered from it or something like that. Maybe a henchman or follower has the ability to use one spell ability once a day. And it was just a gift or a boon, or even in their point of view, maybe even a curse that they have the, the power to create, Tensor's floating disc or something to carry your ill-gotten gains out of the uh, out of the dungeon, and that's the only spell they have. And they're one day they're they're going to graduate one day, but unfortunately, you know that's all they can do. Uh, Polaris says vampires seem to have quite a few things with thralls and all that jazz. Vampires are pretty pretty commonly they're they're surrounded by uh, let's see what was it in White Wolf they were known as ghouls, they ghouls and thralls blood. Uh, blood bound to them and whatnot. And, you know, your big bad guys are probably going to be surrounded by and having in their employer a ton of henchmen and followers. And there might be some overlap for player characters and the, the bad guys, right? There might, that overlap might be them hiring or even b being surrounded by like, Hey, I'm following you. Cause I don't want to be in, 
in the thrall of the vampire that lives in a city. The player's like, what vampire? I didn't hear about any vampire. And like, yeah, the vampire that's in the city. I can lead you to him, but I'm, w- once I lead you to the door, I'm not going through it. You do it, you know? And maybe that then that individual is like a, a, a dompier now <laughs> in the employ or the uh, loyal to the player character or something. Uh, Zamara says, you mean like how uh, Luffy's One Piece crew is made up of eight or so people who keep splitting up. Yep, plus 1,500 hangers on that force their associate with him, uh, 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 force their association with him against his wishes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a ton of hangers on. <laughs> yeah. Like, leave me alone, right? Yeah, I, I, I like your idea there, um, Mike, about um, about a like a criminal organization under the noses of like an, an, an imperial empire or something like that. Yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Mike goes on to say, no one suspected the heavy set, uh, gregarious middle aged lady of being a crime boss. Her children were messengers. Yep. Hey, Game of Thrones did the same thing. Um, it, it seemed a little creepy, but remember uh, Viserys and his little, the, the spider, and he had his little uh, sparrows just flitting around, the, the, the orphan children running around, getting, you know, because of course the kids can sit in the background, they can hear everything, they see everything that goes on and report back. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, Zamar says, uh, did did you just make Owlman a henchman? He peered into the abyss and blinked. Yeah. yeah. Blink, blink. No! Oh, I can't believe I saw that. Unless that's just one of the player characters getting undressed and yeah, walk around the corner. It's like, no, I'm an NPC. I saw a random encounter. I didn't mean to see that. Michael says, I love giving PCs familiars. Um, eccentric personalities and quirks, especially especially fiends. Yep, like imps and quasits will always interpret orders. <laughs> yeah. I thought you said, when you said, you know, uh, get me a mount, uh, uh, Dead Man says, like, Dol- Dolik Rag Vindir from Genshin Impact PC game completely unfamiliar with that and i know i butchered the name um an ex knight of Favin- favinius that retired to the adventurer's life and still protects the region um you uh, sometimes we 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 give um our henchmen and hirelings of followers the the proverbial neutral age neutral cultural culture neutral background meaning like they fall somewhere in this middle range of not being uh, of not uh, they become uh, so much in the background that they fade like a like a sky blue shirt and khaki pants right it's like this thing where where they become furniture and so uh, and this has to deal with uh, with Dead Man's uh, comment that a, a really great way to make like henchmen and followers and NPCs really interesting is to push them towards the extremes of our what we consider uh, social neutrality, meaning like giving them uh, very high or lower age ranges, um, children to elderly, um, uh, culturally changing them. Uh, someone from it, what was it? Um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, you know, Morgan Freeman played the Moor that's traveling around, you, you know, England with his, his uh, uh, devoted to his best buddy, right? Have someone come from a, a, a different racial or cultural um, heritage and, of course, giving them quirks and things, whether it's uh, something in their speech or the way they, they behave, or maybe they, they have a, uh, a very non-traditional religious habit or something of that nature. And stretching stretching those limits out, and people who have strange backgrounds, like, oh, I used to be a very famous and noble knight, but now I'm just a sellsword. And the player, and of course, the PCs come along, and he's got the rusted sword, and he's got the dirty outfit. But then you realize, like, maybe at night they're praying to the gods, and and this individual is for for uh, for in this world is like 
upper middle age. They've got the gray hair and, you know, a, a little stoop shouldered, but they're still pretty knowledgeable and, you know, pretty prideful. I can still defend myself with my sword and shield. And the players are like, all right, well, I'll hire you. And then come to find out that maybe they used to be a real knight. And, you, you know, we don't, I know this is something that's not, this is a non-mechanical thing, but who's to say that, you know, this knight got to like seventh level in their life and then age and depression and battle fatigue and so many other things happened in life. And now they're only like second level uh, due to uh, the ravages of time and despair and whatnot. And they want to get that back. And the players don't know this about their, the background of the NPC, but maybe the NPCs, you know, maybe the NPC really did look into the abyss and saw something there. Maybe saw one of their loved ones and was like, shit, how am I going to get them back? And maybe they become, um, maybe they become loyal to the player characters because they have an agenda and the agenda is not to rob them or backstab them. But you know, if I could, if I could find someone, no one's going to believe me, but if I could just find someone who opened up a portal to hell, I could get back my loved one. And that might even literally be the impetus for, all right, all right, guys, you guys have reached seventh level. We're going to do Out of the Abyss, and this is how you get there because one of your NPCs is like, I got to get my family members back, you know, and, and you're um, um, devoted to that. Mike's like, uh, like I got the idea for Moms from Justified Season 2. Ooh, <laughs> just a, I haven't seen Justified in a while. Um, yeah, Mags Bennett was my, was my inspiration, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Some something about the the kindly old lady. There's something actually scary about the criminals who don't look or act like criminals. You know, they're very kind. Um, sometimes it can even be scary when they're nice to you. When you find out, like in the beginning, you're like, "Oh, thanks for the pastry, there, moms." And then later on, you're like, "You're giving me a pastry. That means you're going to cut a limb off." Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Zamara says, uh, have the players befriend the mother or child of the big bad evil guy. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Who is unaware of the evils they are committing and just looking for their family. Yep. Yep. As a matter of fact, strange bedfellows at the big bad evil might appreciate the player characters taking care of their loved ones inadvertently. And then, the public might blame the player characters for being on the side of the big bad evil who now through connection of the players taking care of their loved ones now know so much more about the player characters, who they are, their capabilities, what their goals are. And, you know, whether it's a fiend or a, 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 an evil lich or an old hag or something that shape changed or whatever, a doppelganger. And it's just like, Oh, Oh, they, they can do what? Oh, they've done... Oh, they dispatched who over the, the, the valley? Wow. Ooh, I didn't know they went to... Hmm. I'm going to have to look look at that, you know? And, and heck, there might even be some uh, respect from the big bad evil. Like, look, I don't want to kill you, and I'll let you go for now. Here's a great way if your characters are low level, and the big bad's so high level that there's really no way you can fight them, but maybe the higher level, this... this CR 18 bad guy with second level player characters is like, you know what? I respect what you did. And uh, I'm going to, because of what you did, I'm going to let you leave town. Just make sure you don't come back. Right. And then of course the NPCs are like, but I want to see them. I want to see the PCs again. Mike says, uh, I like the idea of a dragonborn with, with the knight background, who has three massively incompetent cobalt retainers. <laughs> and there's always three. Even if one dies, another one shows up. They're a massive chirping, barking, <laughs> barking overly loyal creatures stumbling over each other to be the first to serve a cup of coffee. Yep. Yep. They're like, uh, why are you being chased by city guards? They're like, well, I stole the cup of coffee. <laughs> Why did you do that? You know, um, but yeah, why why can't we play with uh, henchmen and hirelings? And I do feel like, uh, uh, kind of going back to something Cameron brought up, like, well, how do you get, how do you encourage the player characters to use them? 
a lot of that's been taken away. Oh, why did you guys do that? Fifth edition? Why? The, the, these are the these are the, the the vectors of telling great stories. But uh, again, if you want your world, what you could do is just have far more repercussions in your world, and henchmen, hirelings, retainers, followers become the they become the lubricant to move through the world so that the player characters don't get overwhelmed. They are, hey, if you need to tell your player characters about some new regime and a new part of your, your map that you just opened up to them, hey, the NPC that's loyal to the player character tells them, oh, by the way, when you come into town, um, all strangers must stand in the red circle. And uh, before you are invited into someone's home or something like that, and like red circle, and I see these red circles painted on the ground, and you're like, uh, okay, I didn't didn't know that. Thanks for letting me. Like, no, no problem, boss. <laughs> Anytime, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Kylie says, once you get gone, you stay gone, or you'll be gone. Marcellus Wallace, grateful boss monster. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with a foot massage. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, um, why wouldn't big bad evil guys don't have to roll initiative? They can just go, listen, I could kill you right now and all of my 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 loyal criminal underground or whatever it is. I'm, a, I'm an evil lich and I've got an undead army. And yeah, we could kill you right now, but I respect you for, you know, watching out for my still mortal living family even though i've been alive for 10 generations or something so i'm going to let you leave and so now the player characters are like okay we know who the big bad evil is we are have no capabilities to fight them but we are we also have a connection to their loved ones and they are loyal to us so what do we do how do we navigate this you know uh cameron says is there a better resource for hirelings than the AD list? Wow. I bet. Mm, I bet there's an OSR. Uh, con I bet there's OSR content out there through like Lamentations of the Flame Princess, uh, Sorcerers and something in Sorcerers or Sorcerers and Swords and Sorcery. Like, I bet there's a free remodeled version of it, but I bet it's all OSR. I I'm sure someone like followers, and st uh, strongholds and followers, uh, there's something more fifth edition related to it, but off the top of my head, uh, I, you're probably going to have to find a list from like a, an, an OSR themed blog or something. Yeah, Mike. Mike says a colorful, a uh, colorful living world needs colorful living beings in it. And and I want to uh, um, add to this that that uh, <laughs> I just want to add to this that uh, like having having the world and the NPCs having things happen to them outside the purview of the player characters can really draw them in. That dragonborn. Who, who likes to have a lot of fun with those kobolds and those kobolds one day don't show up is going to be like, oh, I feel like a limb is missing. Where'd the kobolds go? And then you find out that maybe there's a there's a great worm or something that that like said, you know, told the kobolds, you work for me now. And the player's like, they don't work for you. They're with me. And the dragon's like, no, 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 no. They work for me. Go away, humanoid looking dragon thing. <laughs> right? And, and so, yeah, Give, give them something and take it away. Mm -mm -mm. Now, Zamara says, uh, uh, as a co-host says, well, we as DMs can encourage it. Um, writing the way the world works, a puzzle solved by 10 men praying. An army needs to be held off while the Baron is negotiated with. L right, like, like the... <clears throat> the players might be uh, overcome with not having enough hands uh, to solve all the issues. So again, like Zamar is saying, like an army needs to be held off while the Baron's negotiated with. Sure, we're, we're, the PCs are doing, you know, they're doing their charisma checks, but, you know, if the Baron needs to be 
negotiated with and there's an army outside maybe to hey hey maybe they're there to arrest the nobles and the pcs are like no we need to have a conversation first the henchmen and hirelings might be out there doing the physical battle before the thing or it could be the opposite way players are like we'll, we'll fight off the army while you go in and 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 speak for us with the baron and, and they're, they're like the henchmen are like good thing We'll, we'll do that or probably more like followers or something like yeah we'll go in there and talk to the baron and so maybe there's too many things happening in the world and they don't have enough hands so they need hands to, to get everything together like for example they're um like right here in the states uh hurricane ida comes comes on shore oh man well we we need a sailing sh- vessel we need to get our stuff stuff on the ship uh, we're being hunted by city guards. We need to make a deal with the underground world or something. And as as the problem stack, as the as the puzzle of life, whether it's a real puzzle or or just navigating life in general, we always. How many times have we all said in our own lives, "Man, I wish I had more time in a day." Well, this is for them. Hey, boss, I just picked up your newly minted sword and armor and shield from the 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 armory oh i forgot about that thanks because i was already doing my alchemical experiments while i also was trying to make a deal with the underworld right so yeah anyway uh let's see uh zamar says uh there are ways around the freedoms that 5e has shackled us with (laughs) yeah we just need to learn to embrace the limitations i i definitely agree uh as a matter of fact you could just explain Maybe a ranger has a bunch of uh, scouts. And why does a ranger never get lost? It's because I got scouts. That's why. <laughs> Mike's like, I just just watched Pulp Fiction. Yep. Zamar goes, anyway, good morning, all. May your day be merry. And remember, you are the hero of your story. And you wouldn't get far without the NPCs in your life opening your doors. We're going to have to end it on that one because I love that. I, I love that so much. So, guys, have a great one out there. Um be safe, be awesome. Yeah, I, I will. Mike, seriously, that was a great edit. Mike says a group may need to in, um, endear themselves with the Thieves Guild. That may mean uh, needing to get arrested for a tavern brawl so you can be jailed next to a captured thief. That may lead to an escape contract. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I like the we need to get arrested because of a thing. And also, listen, NPCs, we know in real life sometimes... Uh, someone's last name, someone's bloodline, someone's title, someone's job function, uh, someone's culture, someone's race or religion might be the thing to open a door that your talky talk might not be able to do. N- despite the fact you might find it annoying or hideous or reprehensible, uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to talk to a the, the head dragon of the kkk right but maybe there is a an ex-convert that one day goes i know we've been best for 12 years but i gotta tell you something i got like a kkk robe in my in my closet and i'm just like what and that might be you know what i mean so players might be um might be able to open a door that they didn't weren't able to open before so that's why i really love um, Zamara's comment that maybe the NPCs opened the door. Maybe that's how the noble knight is able to talk to the thieves guild, you know? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you guys are so funny. Like, Dead Man says, or more accurately, Roddy Turtle, Scaly, and Kobold. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Zamara says, to enter into a school in my world, you need to have dragon's blood. See? And that might be the thing like, like, there might be a closed door in your world and you go, damn, how do I get the players through the door when, like the Benny Gesserit, only women can learn the psychic powers of so-and-so and none of the players are, are women. How do I get them in? Oh, the NPC that has a connection to the aunt that that's there who might make an exception to speak to them in the back alley, you know? And and so, yeah, they, I get it. So guys, anyone, anyway, have a great one. We'll, we'll continue to talk about this uh, further on and whatnot. But you guys get the point that I, I think there's there still is space to use a lot, a ton of NPCs. And again, this is a shared experiment where 
players get to use it's not it shouldn't just be dm facing where hey i've got 37 npcs and then you just use them um <laughs> you're so wrong there mike yeah dragon blood on my knuckles bam hey cam no no problem it's, it's I, you know what sometimes I, I i love finding like little things that that on their surface are like I don't see what the big deal is. And then going like, oh, well, maybe, maybe there's something more to this. Maybe. <laughs> you know. Anyway, guys, um, uh, everybody have a great one. Kylie and everybody out there, thank you very much for, for tuning in. Um, have a great day. I will see thee tomorrow.